great time of worship this morning. Could be the, the VBS that transformed the church. I don't know. But there is a spirit here today that is just incredible. So I thank the Lord for his presence. Brother Mark, it's good to see you this morning. Thank you for worshiping uh, with us on this Lord's Day. If you have your Bible, I want you to ter- turn to three different passages of Scripture. It's called Strong Families is what I want to talk about today. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, uh, Matthew chapter 7, and then 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you can find Ecclesiastes chapter 8, uh, you're a third there, and we'll walk you through the other two passages of Scripture that we'll be looking at today. But as we get closer to to Father's Day. My heart has really turned towards the family. We'll challenge dads next Sunday. But I wanted us on this Lord's Day to think about uh, what a strong family looks like. Uh, God wants us to have the strongest families of all. The people of God ought to strive. doesn't mean we always have the strongest family, but we ought to put those principles in place that will help us to be one. And here we find some principles in God's Word in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, Matthew chapter 7, and 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that I think that can really help us today. So hopefully you have found Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Let's all stand together as we pray and we ask the Lord to speak to us and these moments as we open up his word together. Father, we love you. We thank you so much, Lord, for this time of worship. As our hearts just turn to you, as we lift high the name of Jesus, we thank you for the spirit in this place that we know is simply your presence. And I thank you today that it's felt so powerfully. We pray as we open your word today, Lord, that you would help us to open our hearts to you, open our lives that we would pray throughout this time together, Lord, help me to have a strong family, whether I'm a family of one, a family of two, a family of several. Father, help me to have a strong family. Help me to be that catalyst. Help me to be that, that hub that, that begins to pray and strive and to be that person that will allow us to have that kind of family. I thank you for every person in this place today. We pray this, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to share with you about how to have a strong family. You know, in order to have a strong family, God must be the builder of the house. That he is our our contractor who lays out the blueprint for us in his word, how we can have that kind of unit. In Psalms chapter 127 and verse 1, the psalmist says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. In other words, God has to be the builder. God has to be the one who puts our home together. We have to do it according to his blueprint, uh, according to his design, and we have to let him be the Lord of our lives. We have to let God do the building. But it needs someone that will be that person who will follow him. And if you build it, And if I build it, listen, if society builds it, our house will be weak because it was built by human beings. And we know that it will not be very strong. It will not be one that brings him honor and glory. But what a difference it makes when God builds the house and not us. And the reason why is because God is able to lay that foundation that is so important. In his autobiography, Dave Thomas, the the founder of Wendy's, not our Dave, the, the other Dave, right, tells about his difficult childhood. And Dave had been adopted. I'm not sure if you know his story, but he didn't learn until he was 13 years of age that he had been adopted. Uh, he, his adoptive mother passed away when he was quite young. His adoptive father had several wives after she passed away. He and Dave had a very tense relationship. But there was his adoptive grandmother. Her name was Minnie Sinclair. And Dave talks about her quite a bit. She taught him about hard work. She taught him about faith. She taught him about excellence. I'm not sure if she taught him about hamburgers, but somebody did along the way. But she taught him about prayer and a lot of other very important things. 
And later, as he became a huge success, as we saw all of these Wendy's franchises open up all across our nation, he began to consider how important the family is to an individual. That even though he had a very difficult relationship with his adoptive father, he began to think about his adoptive grandmother, Minnie Sinclair, and how her wisdom and how her encouragement and how her strength was the foundation of his life. And even though all of those things in his family may not have been perfect, he would say this, while all families are imperfect, they give each member a sense of belonging. You know, there are very few things that should be more important to us than having a strong family. Other than our relationship with God, which ought to reign supreme for all of us today, our family should be next on the list. That they ought to only be second to our relationship with our Heavenly Father. That they ought to be a priority. They should be more important than our career. They should be more important than our hobbies, those things that we enjoy that sometimes can take over our lives. They ought to be more important than our achievements, those things that we're trying to accomplish, all good things, but sometimes those good things can come above our Lord. Our social standing, above good grades and popularity and and financial wealth, and you can name many other things that sometimes that we put before our relationship with God and, and our relationship with our family. You see, in order to have a strong family, we must let God make some changes. And that's the hard work. In fact, in some areas, God needs to make some drastic changes for us to have a strong family after the dedication of his baby brother in church. Uh, little Johnny uh, sobbed all of the way home in the back seat of the car. I mean, he cried, he cried, and he cried some more. His father asked little Johnny three times what was wrong. He said, son, what's, what's the matter? And he just kept crying. Son, what's wrong? He kept crying. He, a third time, son, tell us what's going on. And, and he kept crying. But, but finally, little Johnny spoke up, and he said, that pastor said he, he wanted us to be brought up in a Christian home, Dad. He said, yeah, he sure did. He said, but I want to stay with you guys. <laughs> You know, sometimes God has to make some drastic changes for us to have a strong family. And so what are some of the things that that all of us need for God to help us to become just a little stronger? How can we please God? I'm going to start with something very simple, then work our way out. But the first thing I want to encourage you to do uh, today on this Lord's Day is to play together to play together. Can you imagine we'd say that today in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 15? Could it be that simple where Solomon says, so I commended enjoyment because a man has nothing better under the sun than to eat, drink, and be merry. For this will remain with him in his labor all the days of his life, which God gives him under the sun. I want to encourage you to play together. As Solomon, the wisest man who has ever lived, other than Jesus himself, gives this great charge, he does so with the understanding that life is a great gift that comes from the Lord. In fact, in James chapter 1 and verse 17, James would say every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. James says every good gift, every perfect gift comes from above. I mean, God has blessed us in in so many ways. And the greatest gift we would say other than eternal life is that God has given us life on this earth. It's an amazing thing that we often take for granted. We are so blessed by Him, and life is to be lived to the fullest. It's not how long we live, it's what we do with the time that God gives us on this earth, that we should grasp it and we should pursue it with all of our hearts. And the reality is that the the time that we have together on this earth is very brief. It goes by really fast. And that's true as you begin to look around, don't you? And you watch your, 
your kids and, and they begin to, to grow up. That's the case with us. I'm starting to do this now. I mean, I'm not super tall, as you well know. I prayed for height, and, and God gave me good looks. I don't know what it was, but I don't know what happened. Just kidding, just kidding. But, but you can tell I'm not real tall, but, but I'm starting to look up now. If Elizabeth passes me up, I'm really going to be humbled, I'm telling you. But you begin to look at your kids and you realize, yeah, life it goes by real fast. You have grandchildren, many of you, and, and you're watching them start high school real soon. And, and you're watching them graduate, maybe go off to college and get married and start having children of their own. And you think, wow, life goes by really fast. Then you look in the mirror one day and you realize, yes, life is really going by super fast. The reality is that the time that we have together goes by so quickly. It's especially true as you begin to think about your own family. They tend to grow up. They tend to change change over time. It doesn't matter whether or not you blink or not, that still takes place. And so the psalmist tells us we must be really good at math. We must be really good when it comes to his kind of math. Because in Psalms chapter 90 verse 12, the psalmist says, so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. That, Lord, it's really not about the years, it's not about the months, it's not about the weeks. It's really about the days. Lord, help us to number our days, not to be somber, but to make sure that we maximize every moment that God gives us with our families. And all the duties that come our way, we must be sure that we remember along the way to play together. That life is more than work, it's more than school, it's more than chores. It's more than bills, and it's more than fixing things up around the house, even though all of those are very important. They need to be done, but we must remember to take time for fun. We must make sure that we enjoy those that God has strategically and divinely put right around us. We must put fun first. We must put it on the calendar. Many of you have done that this summer. You're saying, hey, we're going to go somewhere for a couple of days, going somewhere for a weekend, going somewhere for a week. We're just going to put it on the calendar. Uh, sometimes we have to get creative. You know, sometimes we just have to leave some things at work. We're not going to finish everything before that appointment. We're not going to finish everything before that ball game. We're not going to accomplish everything before that commitment with our family. And so the time that God has given to you as a family is so precious. Don't miss out on these years. You will never get them back. You cannot hit rewind. Live with no regrets. And so do those things that your family enjoys. Go to, the, go to the mall, uh, play in the yard, take a vacation. I love what Robert Orban said. He said, who can ever forget Winston Churchill's immortal words? We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields. We shall fight in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. He goes on to say, it sounds like our family vacation. <laughs> But make sure that you take that time together. Follow your children, your grandchildren's sporting events. What an opportunity. Enjoy a hobby together. It's the times that we play together that we cherish the most. Make sure that you play together. But also today, obey together. Here in Matthew chapter 7 and verses 24 through 27, we find Jesus speaking this wonderful parable. And he tells us how to, to build our family, how to build our lives. We must do so on the rock of obedience. And he says here in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it fell and great was its fall. 
If we're going to have a rock-solid family, it's imperative that it's built on the right foundation. As Jesus spoke these words of instruction, he gives a comparison, you'll notice, between two builders who erected a house. Everything looked the same from the curb. I mean, they had the same style house. They were in the same subdivision, if you will. They had the same garage. They had the same pitch of the roof. I mean, when you looked at it from the street, you would say that it looked exactly the same. Everything looked great until a storm came and it began to test their structure. We know about that in South Louisiana, don't we? We know that along the coast. We, we know about hurricanes. We know the damage that they can bring to a home. And some homes do very well and, and some they don't do all that well. But in this case, it was not about the roof and it was not really about the walls. It was about the foundation. Because when the rain fell and the wind blew, the house that was built on a solid rock stood tall. And the house that was built on sand, well, it kind of collapsed. He tells us here in verse 24, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Not only the person who hears these sayings of mine, But you'll notice in verse 24, he who does these sayings of mine. He that not not only hears them with his ears, but who lives them out with his heart or her heart or feet. Those are the people that build their house. They build their lives. They build their families upon the principles of God's word. He uses the the word rock here, the word Petra. We have a Petra in our service today. It's a large expanse of bedrock. It is solid. It is unmovable. Jesus says we are to build our house on a rock, that solid foundation that he gives to us. Do you know how your house can be built on a rock? It's by not only hearing, but it's by obeying what God has said to us in his word. Because there are truths, there are principles that God has for you as a family, that he has for us as a family. We don't have to wonder what he wants us to do. He has given us much of his will for our lives in his word. I mean, I would say many times 75, 80% of God's will for your life, it's right in front of you. He's already given it to us in his word. And we call that his corporate word, uh, his corporate will. That's what he has for all of us. But he has a very specific will that he has for your family. But in his word is where we find how we can obey together. The writer of Proverbs in chapter 4 and verse 13 said, take firm hold of instruction. Do not let go. Keep her, for she is your life. Sometimes we make it hard on ourselves because we do not follow God's instructions. And it's hard to have a strong family and to do it your way and not God's way. Or to do it your way and his way, which is really impossible. The only way for us to have a rock-solid family is to hear what he has given us in his word, to read it as well, and to pray, Lord, help us to be that kind of people. Whether we're a family of one or two or, or several, God, help us to allow your word to be what navigates our decisions, navigates what we will allow in our home. Allow, allow us to obey your word and to follow you. He always has the best way. Most of the time, his way is so much easier. I heard about three men who were hiking through a forest when they came upon a large, raging, violent river and needing to somehow get to the other side. Uh, the first man prayed. He said, God... Please give me the strength to cross the river. And poof, God gave him big arms. He gave him strong legs. Listen, he was able to swim across in about two hours. The only problem is he almost drowned twice. It was a tough go for him. Well, after witnessing that, the second man decided to pray. He said, God, please give me strength and tools to cross the river. Poof, God gave him a rowboat. Strong arms, 
strong legs. He was able to row across in about an hour, but he almost capsized once. It wasn't an easy feat for him. Well, the third guy was pretty sharp. He, seeing what had happened to the first two men, the, first, the third man prayed. He said, God, please give me the strength, the tools, and the intelligence to cross the river. And poof, he was turned into a woman, believe it or not. <laughs> she checked the map, hiked 100 yards upstream, easily and casually walked across the bridge unharmed. <laughs> the key is that she checked the map. You know, God has given us a map for life. It's not our map or someone else's map. God has already given us a map. It's his word. And what a difference it makes when we obey God and we follow his instructions. He needs to be our navigator as we build our families on the rock of obedience. Not only must we play together, not only must we obey together, but listen, when we do these things and others, through God's power, we are able to stay together. We're able to stay together here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 in verses 4 through 8. You'll notice that the Apostle Paul is writing to these believers in Corinth. They, they needed a, a long lesson when it came to love. And he says this in verse 4, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Look at verse 7. I love this. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Look at verse 8. Paul says, love never fails. We live in a day when some families are so frail and so weak. Many are just one event away from coming apart. Maybe that's your family today, or if you're watching online, you'd say, that's, that's my family, or maybe it has come apart recently. Billy Graham once said, the moral foundation of our country is in danger of crumbling as families break up and parents neglect their responsibilities. Wouldn't you agree this morning that the family is truly the moral foundation of our nation? It's the hub of civilization, and as the family goes, we would say, so goes the country, so goes the nation, that God has given us the family, uh, the people of God, as the strength and the foundation uh, for everything else. And all of us know that life can bring some very unpredictable, unpredictable uh, turns in life. Many are unfortunate. Uh, things that are beyond our control. And the great challenge for all of us is to take the family that God has given to us right now and to keep them together, to keep them following Jesus, and to be strong in the power of our Lord. I served as a pastor in Lake Charles before I came here. I was there for 16 years, and I was at Tommy Bear Road Baptist Church, and Right after I got there to, to be their pastor in 98 and 99 in the spring, uh, there was a couple that joined our church, Ricky and, and Gail Wolf. When I say those names, Christy smiles. They were great friends of ours. We, we loved them, and they kind of adopted us into their family as, uh, as pastor and, and uh, as friends and everything. But what was fascinating about them, they were in their mid-40s at the time. They had six children. And that was really neat to a young couple at the time who we didn't have any kids yet. We were just watching them with these six kids. He had three kids, and his wife had walked out on him. She had three kids. Her husband had walked out on her, and they met together. Remember the Brady Bunch years ago? If you don't know what that is, Google it. You'll figure it out. But they had everyone but the housekeeper, Alice. I mean, she had three, he had three, and, and then they got married. And we'd go over to their house for dinner sometimes, and, and it was just unbelievable to watch them. But I used to ask Ricky. We'd go to a lot of the Mackneys football games together. We were good buddies. And I would ask Ricky sometimes. I'd say, uh, I said, how do you guys do it? I mean, how do you... How do you make all this work? I mean, her three, your three, and life, and everything else. And he called me Rev. He had a real deep voice. 
And he said, Rev, he said, I told Gail that if she ever decided to leave, then she might as well pack two suitcases because we're in this together. I'm going with her if she leaves one day. <laughs> you know, that was a long time ago. They've been married probably 35 years now. Their kids are grown and gone and, you know, probably a little younger than I am. Now they have grandkids. But I still remember what he told me about that because they experienced just about every challenge in life, but they chose to stay together. That's a choice that we make. We ought to say, Lord, through thick and thin, through all the challenges of life, we are family. We're going to work through all the issues that come our way and we're going to give you the honor and the glory. Did you notice the, the great qualities of love that needs to be in your home and my home as the people of God? It's here that, that Paul tells us as we think about love that love bears all things, love believes all things, that love hopes all things, and then he says love endures all things. That's the kind of love that we ought to pray for. Listen, that's a supernatural love. It, it doesn't come from any other human being. It's not something that you can muster within your own life. That's a love that comes through a relationship with Jesus. As Paul says in Romans 5, that God has literally poured his love into our hearts. And when Jesus is our Savior and God is our Father and the Holy Spirit is our guide, it's then that we can bear, believe, hope, and endure all things because we operate with the greatest love in all the world, and that's the love of Jesus Christ. I love what he says in verse 8. That's probably my favorite part of the entire verse where Paul says, love never fails. Not sometimes it works, not most of the time it works. Listen, I want a I wanna love that never fails, don't you? I want one that's 100% trustworthy. And we can trust in the amazing love of God that says, God, as we operate as a family unit, that we're going to stay together because we believe that your love is always greater. There's some ways that we can live this out on this Lord's Day as we think about having a, a stronger family. The first thing I want to encourage you to do is to give your life to Him. I mean, you have to believe in Him completely. You have to trust Him as your Lord and Savior. That's step one. Great families put God first. It begins with a relationship with Jesus. I mean, you can have a good family. You can have a pretty strong family, but it's not the same as when he is building the house, as the psalmist would say, as we said from the onset. You must give your life to Him. You must believe in Him completely completely. And so this morning, is he your heavenly father? And then also this morning, surrender uh, to him regularly. That you would surrender to him regularly. Think about your family. That you would celebrate your family. That you would uh, put God first together. That you would thank him for every single person that he has given to you. Surrender to him regularly. That starts as a dad starts as a mom, starts as a student, that you surrender your life to him and you make him not only your savior, but you allow him to be your Lord. When we put him first, great things can happen. We must also depend on him fully. God can help you to be great. And so this morning, would you ask him for his help, that he will give you everything that you need. You must depend on him fully. God is able to give you the power that you need. And then fourthly and finally as we close today, live for him passionately. That we'd say, God, help us to be passionate. Help me to be passionate in the role that you've given me. Because I do realize that every day counts and life goes by so fast and I don't want to miss the opportunities to be who you desire for me to be. I want to be the, the greatest Husband, I want to be the greatest dad, the greatest grandparent. Listen, I want to be the greatest mom, grandmother, student. I want to honor you with my life. And I commit myself today that I'm going to believe in you completely. I'm going to surrender to you regularly. I'm going to depend on you fully. And I'm going to live for you passionately because you have lit a flame in my heart. Join that extended family. Live for him passionately and let the church 
be that support that you need as you become all that God desires. Let's pray together. Father, we love you today. We thank you for these moments of commitment. And I realize today if, if all of us are honest, we would say we have a long way to go to be a strong family. There's always challenges. There's always improvements that need to be made. Lord, may that start with me. May that start with us. May it start with our prayer to you, just saying, God, that's, that's what we want. That's what we desire. Because we thank you for the family that you've given to us. And we want to be strong. And we know that the only way it can be strong is to be built upon the right foundation to allow you to be the one who builds our home. I pray that all of us today will turn ourselves to you and allow you not only to be our Savior, but to be our Lord. I pray for those who have never trusted Jesus as their Savior. Today, I pray that they would say yes to you as we begin to sing. I pray for those who have trusted you as their Savior. In just a moment, they're going to step out and come forward and say, I, I gave my life to Christ. I need to, to make it public. I I want to get baptized. Many of our students that are here today, and Father, I pray for them that as we begin to sing, that they would step out and say, I gave my life to Jesus. I prayed the ABCs. I meant it with all my heart. And I want to follow Jesus. I pray for Christians today in this place. I pray for dads and moms. I pray for students. Lord, that once again, that we would commit ourselves in whatever role you have given to us, to say, Lord, I'm, I'm going to love you with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength. And Father, I know that my neighbor starts underneath my roof. That the first neighbor that I ought to love is my family. So help me, Lord, not only to love you, but to love them. And not to overlook them or to put other things before them. Forgive us when we do. And Father, I pray for those today that are looking for a place to worship and serve and commit uh, today. If you're leading them, I pray that they also would come. We love you. We thank you for your activity in our hearts and our lives. And we thank you that all of these things can be accomplished through your strength. We pray this. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.